Boshi san and welcome back to the dojo. Now, normally Sifu sends me kung fu films to study and try to learn martial arts from, but I thought maybe every once in a while we can do something different. I'm actually a big fan of Japanese animation, and so I thought, hey, between bouts of kung fu, why don't we, me and you, uh, talk about anime? Not so fast, Boshi san. That's my turf. I thought you just did ninja films. I. I branch out. Well, I could just do whatever works. I... I don't think this look works. Yeah, I think you're right. For a show like this, I need something with... more dignity, something more appropriate, something like... the outfit of a ringside announcer with class. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Schiavone. You have your cross to bear, working with Jesse the Body Ventura. My duty, I must say, a whole lot more pleasant. Ah, Mean Gene Okerlund. Ridiculous. And we get match! Hadouken! In Anime Deathmatch, 96 Japanese animated movies will compete against each other for the title of Anime Ultimate. Why 96? Well, I wanted to do a round number like 100, but it turns out that's pretty difficult to structure by brackets. And not every anime makes the cut. This is not a fight for the weak or merely choosy. Now, who's entering the ring? Now, I know there are a lot of top whatever lists and shows that focus on riffing bad anime, and hey, I love those too. There's some great funny work out there, but the top lists tend to recycle the same few popular directors over and over. Critic shows side more with tearing down deservedly bad anime while only rarely pointing viewers to undiscovered gems. I don't pretend I'm going to fix that, or even that there's really anything to fix. But there's also a fixation on anime series and franchises over the last few years, despite a surprising glut of good anime movies released. So Anime Deathmatch is strictly about long, self-contained films. And around here, we got rules. Rule 1. All films need to be at least 20 minutes long. Yes, that allows for longer shorts playing as part of an anthology, as long as they otherwise would stand alone. Anthologies as a whole, however, are disqualified. <laughs> Rule number two, all films should stand alone. Films just part of a franchise or compilations of a previous series need not apply. And even some films, which are otherwise worth watching, are honestly not really anything more than lost or final episodes stretched into feature-length films. Rule number three, I won't lie, this is a personal list. Not every Ghibli film is on it because... <gasps> SHOCK! I just don't like all of them. It happens. Maybe sometime I'll go into depth about why certain films are not my cup of tea, but that's not a concern for Deathmatch. I will say that the reasons why a film is or isn't on Deathmatch's lineup are more developed than just thumbs up or thumbs down. All ratings are silly anyway. During the match itself, I'll work to avoid spoilers, even in judging plots. But as each anime loses, the episode's second half is a video essay exploring the movie in more depth. Then, all bets are off, and spoilers will abound. You've been warned. I will occasionally break these rules. Mostly the second one. Usually because I think the movie is easily accessible aside from its franchise, or it's so unique, so intriguing, that it deserves to be considered. Hadouken! Each anime will be pitted against each other in six categories. Hero, Villain, Plot, Soundtrack, Animation, and X Factor. Victory in each of the first five is fairly self-explanatory and worth a single point. The last category, X Factor, is that little something extra that makes the film stand out from the pack. It could be a unique technique, scene, character, etc., or something as simple and powerful as nostalgia. The X Factor is worth two points. The full slate has been randomly determined, leading to some interesting matchups. They're not all action movies, so be prepared if they don't inspire awe. It can't just be all ghost in the shell all the time. So enough battle. Deathmatch! Test your might. First up, we've got the stop motion fairy tale scorcher of Briar Rose versus Makoto Shinkai's latest emotional slugfest, The Garden of Words. Okay, so not the most explosive start to the show. Like I said, honest randomness. Who are our heroes? Briar Rose, yes, is Sleeping Beauty, but Sleeping Beauty is seen through the eyes of Japanese puppetry. Actually, it's great this is the first film and heroine to step into Deathmatch. 
A reminder that animation is not restricted to just traditional instruments like hand-painted cells or CGI. Somehow the restrained, long-suffering beauty of the princess renders more evocatively in wood than lines filled with color. However, she's not a very active character. Her only attempt to break out of her stifling world only causes more hardship. Rather than being a Disney princess, she dares to invert the archetype. And this is long before Merida or Elsa, by the way. From the Garden of Words, we have Takao, a high school student regularly playing hooky. Like many Japanese male romantic leads, he's young, earnest, and an idealist of human nature. Unlike most, he is thoroughly dedicated to cobblery. Yes, nothing speaks to him like shoes. The older the craftsmanship, the better. Sensitive as he is, when pushed back from his goals, he still charges forward. So who wins? While Briar Rose is a touching and sympathetic portrayal of a doomed woman, that's not terribly inspiring. And to really be a hero, and not just the focus or viewpoint of a plot, inspiring ought to be on the list of job requirements. This round goes to Takao. He might be young and a bit naive, but his dogged dedication to both shoes and love is definitely inspiring. Who are our villains? Which movie offers a more intriguing figure you love to hate? Inverting the fairy tale again, this Sleeping Beauty has no wicked fairy lady, but a dark and brooding one-legged man who mysteriously appears on the eve of the princess's birth. A man with a mysterious connection to her mother. His single appearance at court is upsetting for everyone, and he spends most of his life consigned to the woods. In the garden, Yukino is the closest to a villain. Every so often she meets Takao in the park until an unspoken romance develops. She acts as both a catalyst for his own dreams and an obstacle. Her own reluctance and circumstances pose the greatest challenge. So who wins? This one may rest more on looks and innuendo than fact. Truth is, neither is someone you really want to hate. Victory to the nameless one-legged man. I really had to stretch it to call Yukino a villain. She certainly serves as a romantic antagonist, but that's hardly the same thing. The one-legged man presents his own classification problems, but all of the overarching miseries spring from him, even when they aren't particularly true. Especially when they're not true. According to the world around him, the stranger is a dastardly blackguard. Given his impact on the entire court, his status as nameless stranger is itself menacing. He personifies how easy it is to fear the unknown. What about plot? Which film delivered a more engaging, entertaining yarn? Briar Rose being a retelling of Sleeping Beauty, most of the plot elements are there. A lovely princess is born, and an outside presence threatens her future by cursing her should she prick her finger on a spindle. But unlike most other interpretations, that's just the pretext for the real story. Sorry, gotta stop because of spoilers. The Garden of Words continues a Shinkai tradition of awkward lovers facing near insurmountable barriers. Shai Takao's privacy in the Garden Pavilion is invaded by a beautiful lady throughout Tokyo's rainy season. Over the time, the two confide in each other. She shares her romantic problems. He reveals his offbeat dream of being a traditional cobbler. No, really, cobblery is all over the movie. So who wins? Well, while the inversion of Sleeping Beauty alone is pretty interesting, and yes, I'm being awfully cryptic because that's pretty much the big twist, for the most part, it's more of a character study than a plot-driven story. In the Garden of Words, however, plot revelations of prior heartbreak and oddball dreams are the key to bringing about the romantic climax. Victory goes to Garden of Words! Sure, it's a quiet ride for the most part, but at some point you notice Shinkai stealthily turning up the heat to make passionate outbursts at the end all the more satisfying. Who's got the best animation? Is it the subtlety of Kihichiro Kawamoto's stop motion creations? Or Makoto Shinkai's lush flora? Now stop motion is going to be handicapped here, admittedly, but scenes like the princess trying to fight her way through the forest show off Kawamoto's stunning attention to detail and painstaking technique. Just look at those clothes ripple. But Shinkai, well known already for his integration of traditional designs and CGI, surpasses all his previous endeavors here. That was transcendent. Moving on. Is it the Ren Faire music of a fairy tale or the mooded piano of a Tokyo love story? Komamoto chooses his music sparingly, punctuating his scenes and montages with appropriate period music. It's lively, but the audio quality hasn't weathered well. The eerie oppressive sound of wind alone in the forest is far more haunting. And those strange comedic sound effects. <laughs> Shinkai's musical choices are even more sparing. There's not even an opening theme, just a few piano chords during the title card. However, the light piano music fits the mood of the rainy season, echoing the raindrops, and slowly adding more variety in instrumentation, first strings and then percussion by the end. It's a soundtrack rising alongside the drama. So who wins? The soundtrack historical or the soundtrack sympathetic? There's really no contest here. 
The soundtrack of Briar Rose is fine for a fairy tale, if a bit tinny, but there's no comparison to the emotionally complimentary and dramatically structured piano-based soundtrack. You don't even realize how integral the sound is to the experience, as its subtlety so soundly matches narrative and performance. But now for the final fight, the X-Factor round! Which matters most for a deathmatch? The unique artistic abilities of Kawamoto or the artistic progression of Shinkai? Kihichiro Kawamoto was a bona fide master of mixing both European and Japanese puppetry techniques and translating them into exquisite cut-up and stop-motion animation. He's the only stop-motion director in anime deathmatch, and that very fact is worthy of notice, and maybe a couple of points. Makoto Shinkai has built up an impressive resume in just a little more than a decade as a director, but at first hamstrung artistically by his initial success. His follow-ups to Voices of a Distant Star felt like further explorations of heartache and pathos, but never developed out of their meditative stance until he tried outright adventure with children who chase lost voices. With the Garden of Words, however, he finally grants his lovelorn characters agency and conviction to challenge their romantic fate. For some, this may seem an evolution of only a quiver, but for Shinkai, it's a continental shift. No wonder this goes to Shinkai. His continuing evolution, both visually and narratively, is a welcome change. As wonderful as Kawamoto is, his contributions to the field are in the past. So with a crushing six points to the Fairy Tales 1, the clear winner of the first anime deathmatch is 2013's The Garden of Words. Shinkai's movie now moves on to the next level of the tournament, and we turn our attention to Briar Rose, giving it the depth promised. <laughs> now this is a fast motion sound. That's my truth. <laughs>